sides for supervision help, that would be great. Thank you. Alrighty, good morning guys, if I could have your attention. Thank you. Good morning, ninth graders, some 10th graders, some 11th. We know that there are a few blended classes in here. We're really glad, glad that you could be in here this morning. Um, the Riverwood PTSA, the Parent Teacher Student Association, every year takes on an initiative to do education um, about drug and alcohol awareness. And you have no doubt from reading the paper, watching the news, Every year around this time of year, when we get to homecoming season, there are, unfortunately, um, unnecessary and tragic high school accidents that happen from people who are out having a good time over the weekend, too much of a good time, sometimes being irresponsible. And we don't want it to happen to anyone here at Riverwood. So the PTSA every year takes on an initiative to do some education about drug and alcohol awareness, about the impacts that it can have on people your age and your friends here in the school and your parents in this community. So this morning we have um, a really exciting, a really interesting, a really touching um, story, a set of stories actually to share with you that I think that you'll learn a lot from. And two gentlemen who are sharing stories with you that are personal and um, have touched them in very real ways in their lives. And so they're here to share it with you. I'd like to introduce, and of course, to ask for your respect, your attention, as they go throughout their presentation, but I'd like to introduce two individuals to share their stories with you this morning. Mr. Chris Sandy and Mr. Eric Krug, if you'll give them a good Riverwood round of applause. that introduction and I want to thank each and every one of you for sitting here and giving us this opportunity to share our stories. Uh, my name is Chris Sandy, right over here to my right is Eric Krug and you know we're here simply just to talk about something that's happened in both of our lives to share our stories. We're not here to tell you don't do this and don't do that. We're not here to tell you how to run your life. We just know that all of you are faced with a lot of choices in life and we're hoping, right Eric, that something that we can share with you today can hopefully inspire or influence you to continue on the right track, just so you don't get caught up in something you regret. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to work with a lot of different presenters from all around the country. We have one guy that we work with, uh, Eric Wright, tomorrow we're going to be joining him. His name is Jay Maxwell. He's on uh, America's Got Talent. He's on season six. He's an illusionist and a performer. Um, his dad had been killed by a drunk driver, and that's one of the ways that we had met up. Uh, both Eric and I, the stories that we're going to share with you, they have to do with choices, um, but our stories are completely different. Um, but there is a connection, and almost every person that we meet, we have some sort of connection with, don't we? So uh, we're looking forward to this opportunity this morning. Now, it was a little bit of a crazy drive over here. It's been a real long month. We've gone all over the place to share our stories in hopes to, uh, to help people with the decisions they make. So something I want to do real quick is I kind of want to relax and, and one of the things that uh, Jaden has taught me recently is a couple activities to get kind of like an icebreaker to get everyone to chill out and have a little bit of fun. You know, a big point of this is, you know, when you're having fun, it's one of the easiest times for you to be influenced in a way. You know, you might be influenced to do something you wouldn't normally do because you got yourself in a situation, everyone's having a good time, nobody's thinking about what can happen, and bam, something happens. So here's just a quick uh, idea, just a quick exercise on showing you, you know, the power of influence. It's easy for every one of us to be influenced. And um, so if you would, just participate in this quick activity before we jump into the stories and it gets all crazy once we jump into it because it's hard to talk about. Um, this will kind of help us too. So if you would, real quick, raise your index finger up in the air like this, kind of wiggle it around. It's real simple. And then all you have to do is extend your thumb out like this, and then go ahead and bring it to your forehead like that. No, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not what I was talking about. I'm just kidding. So let's see here real quick. Here's what I wanted to get to. If you will, make an OK sign just like this. And if you will, stretch the OK sign up in the air, bring it down, stretch it out to your side, bring it back in. Real simple stuff that we're talking about here. 
but this time hold it out to your side like this and if you will real quick do this and touch it to your chin just like that that's not your chin that's your cheek and switching at the last moment don't count so listen all we're doing is just demonstrating a few things sometimes when you're not paying attention sometimes when you're not you know in the mood or sometimes maybe you're having too much fun it's real easy to see something and just to jump out there and do it and not think about it so this whole presentation that we're giving you today it's about choices and it's about choices that matter every choice that you make in your life it matters um, no matter what it is that you do sometimes it's easy to get caught up in life thinking that nothing's ever gonna happen thinking that you know that you have it all under control but I'm not here to tell you that everything you do, there's going to be some type of consequence to it. Maybe it's something good. Maybe it's something bad. Eric and I, right, we've had some great things happen in our life, right? Yeah, definitely. We've been in, put ourselves in a good situation. Some good things have happened. But because of Eric's situation and because of my situation, we can certainly tell you what happens when something doesn't go right. When you do something that you regret or you put yourself in a bad situation. This is a picture taken of me in 2004 while I was serving time in a Georgia State prison. I spent um, 3,117 days inside prison. That's about eight and a half years. I'm not here to stand up and tell everybody all these stories about being in prison. I'm not here to try to yell at anyone or scare someone or make up something about prison. That's not who I am. That's not what this is about. Because there is no way I could ever truly describe what it was like being in prison for eight and a half years to anybody. But something that I can share with you is uh, at some point in time in my life, after I caused or made this decision in my life that landed me in prison, when I made this choice, I used to think that this was going to be the worst consequence to life. Like, man, I couldn't even believe I was going to prison. I couldn't even imagine being in there for that long. And I thought there would be nothing worse than being in prison. Well, I'm going to tell you, since I've been out of prison, I certainly understand the reality of this whole thing. All right, that is a fraction of my life. Yes, eight and a half years, it was long. I hated every second of it. But the biggest consequence to this is waking up every day knowing what I did. It's living with my choice. And that's one of the things I want each one of you to think about as you walk out of here today. You have to live with everything you do. Sometimes it's pretty hard to go forward in life when you mess up. The night that I made this choice, I was 22 years old. I don't live real far from here, um, but this house that we were at, we considered it to be out in the country a little bit. I went to a little party. It was on April 11th of 2000. So 22 years old, I was of legal drinking age. My friends and I got together. We started having this little party at this house. And I remember we had this table that was out in the middle of the room. And we had these red Solo cups lined up. And we started pouring all this liquor and beer and stuff and loading it up. And then we're getting the hot night all hyped up. And we're starting to talk a bunch of trash. And before I know it, my friends and I are sitting down. And we grab these cups. And I remember slamming these four drinks back to back to back to back. And after the fourth one, I remember I get a phone call from some of my friends. They're just down the road at another party. So when we find out about this other party, it wasn't just like a get together. Everybody we knew was going to this other party. So as soon as we found out about it, we were ready to go too. So my friend Jesse and I, we walked out to my car. I got into the driver's seat. Jesse, he came around and got into the passenger seat and we took off. Except we never made it to the other party. Now this road that I was driving on, I knew it extremely well. The only way I can describe it to you is maybe putting it like the road that you would drive to to go to your best friend's house. A road that you go down all the time. This is a road I went down all the time. Well, something that I vividly remember about it is because it was a little bit on the outskirts of Atlanta, it was a little bit in the country, it was, um, it went from, it was a two-lane road. It went from 45 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour. You hit a stop sign and made a right-hand turn. And at the end of that road is where my friends lived at. That's where the party was. Something about this first stretch of road, I guess, because we felt like we were never going to get pulled over. Most of the time when we drove on this road, we drove really fast. So that night, as soon as I got onto this road, I had my radio up. Jesse and I were cutting up and laughing. And as I started flying down this road, I was going about 80 miles an hour. I drove right up behind a white minivan. So on this two-lane road, as soon as I drive up behind this white minivan, I look over at my friend Jesse. He nods at me. I nod back. I look right back at the car, and I decide, man, I'm just going to blow past him. 
So I start passing them, and as I'm passing them down the road a little ways right in front of me, all of a sudden I see this oncoming car. They had their left hand turn signal on. It was not like I was so faded and drunk and messed up that I didn't know what was going on. I could tell that this car in front of me was ready to turn across the road to pull into a driveway. So as soon as I saw that, I started to get back over my lane. And as I was getting back over to my lane, all of a sudden I see this gold flash shoot in front of my face and BAM! I hear this incredibly loud and solid sound. And then everything went black. Now after several seconds had passed, I could not see anything yet, but I started to hear my tires slowly roll off the edge of the road. And as soon as they came to a stop, that's when I opened my eyes and I found myself pinned on the passenger side dashboard against the front window. I could barely breathe. Now, I have no idea how I got out of my car. I cannot remember it, but I do know sometime I did because the next thing I could recall was I was crawling in the middle of the road right on the yellow line, and then I stopped. I had to stop because my right leg had been dislocated from my hip, twisted around my back, and where my knee dashboard and ripped out, it was bleeding severely. So because of the pain, I started to fall in and out of consciousness. But the next time that I regained my consciousness, there was this officer standing over me. So everyone in here already knows that if an officer pulls you over, if they're at a scene, they're gonna ask a lot of questions, that's their job. So he's standing over me and he starts to ask me questions. He looks over at me and he says, uh, son, can you tell me how fast you're going? I already knew in the back of my mind, I was going way too fast for this road. I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to get in any more trouble. I had no idea what just happened. So I looked at him and I said, no, sir. Then he went on to tell me how serious this was. They were sending a life flight helicopter to come and get me. Then he offered to notify someone for me, so I gave him my mom's name and number. Then he knelt over me as they're getting me prepared to move me, and he looks right at me, and he takes a deep breath, and he said, have you been drinking? And of course I'd been drinking because I'd slammed these four big cups back to back to back right before I left at the party. But once again, I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to get any more trouble. I didn't know what happened. So I looked at him and I said, no, sir. But as soon as I said those words, I heard someone in the background yell something. And it's those words that I will never forget for the rest of my life. Because as I'm lying there for that split second, worried about going to jail, worried about what happened in my car, I hear someone in the background yell, there's a fatality on the scene. There's a fatality on the scene. And as soon as I heard those words, I realized right then and there that I just killed someone. But I could not believe that something like this is happening. I actually laid there and prayed to God, hoping that when I closed my eyes and opened them up, that maybe all this would go away. I can guarantee every person sitting in here has had something bad happen in their life. So you know that feeling when you get that knot in your stomach and you want to lie down and you're hoping the next day when you wake up, it just all goes back to normal. All that bad stuff goes away. That's what I was hoping when I opened my eyes. The next day when I opened my eyes and I looked around, I found myself laying in the hospital bed in the hospital room. My mom, dad, and sister were there. They told me what happened. And then they let me know all my friends were at the hospital. They were all standing outside. They let a few in at a time. Then they all told me what happened. And then when I got out of the hospital, I read a newspaper article that described everything. It said that I was driving down this back road, passing this white minivan. I was on this road called Jack Neely. It said that as I was passing the white minivan, I was going approximately 77 miles an hour. And they said as I tried to get back over my lane, the oncoming car, you know, the one with the left-hand turn signal on, it was a big four-door sedan, they tried to make a left-hand turn into a driveway, and as soon as they did, I was going way too fast. Jesse and I were cutting up and laughing. I'd already been drinking. I could not stop. And I plowed into the rear passenger door and completely drove through their car, literally cutting it in half leaving the front half of the car around the driveway, and then the rear half was drove another 100 feet down the road. It was an older model car that I hit. It was an old 1984 Ford LTD. This is the front half. Over here, it's a pink blanket. There's definitely significance to everything that's out there. Over here was the rear half of the car. It was stuck on the front of my car. It eventually came off about 100 feet down the road. My car is driving a Ford Pro GT, and I uh, don't even know how we made it through that. So here, this is where the passenger was sitting. It's kind of a dark spot over here, but that's a, a black purse. That purse belonged to the passenger. Her name was Mrs. Nellie King. She was from Covington, Georgia. 
She died on impact and her body was thrown into a nearby ditch. I remember reading and finding out that they were pulling in to a relative's driveway. And the relatives, they're the ones that came out with that pink blanket to cover her up. I did this right in front of all of them. And every one of them saw what I had done. Her husband, Mrs. Nellie King's husband, was the driver. His name was Mr. William King. He and I, we were life flighted to Atlanta Medical Center. But after his first surgery, Mr. King, he also died. I did not know who they were, but they didn't live real far from me. But I promise you, I think about them every single day of my life. It's not like I meant for something like this to happen. I had no idea anything like this would happen. But it did. I used to even believe for a second that uh, like, I didn't understand how they couldn't see me going down that road so fast. Like, why did they have to make that turn? If they wouldn't have turned, this wouldn't have happened. You know what? I know that's stupid to even think like that. I'm just being honest with you on my thoughts. But that right there, that had nothing to do with it. This all happened because that night, I made the choice to go to this party. I made the choice to drink with all of my friends. I made the choice to jump in my car. I made the choice to drive fast. And I will promise you I'll regret every one of those choices for the rest of my life. How could I not? I killed two wonderful people. They were in the early 70s. They have a daughter named Susan. Their granddaughter's name's Tara. Tara was in middle school when I caused this crash. She's now in elementary school in Newton County. It's the only family member that's really talked to me. The rest of the family, could you even imagine what they think of me? Tara wrote me a letter or an email two, two years ago. She's a friend on my Facebook. She sent me a Facebook request too. She wanted to encourage me to continue to go out and share the story, but it's also a reminder that there's nothing I will ever be able to do in my life that's going to change what I did. And I knew that because of what I did, I knew where I was going to end up. I didn't know for how long. I didn't know what to expect. I've seen people get a year. I've seen people get five years. I've seen people get 30 years. I had no idea what to expect. But a year after the crash, it was on April 10, 2001, I went to court. My parents hired uh, some big attorney here in Atlanta, and they were trying to do whatever they could for me. Um, well, I didn't know what to expect. I knew how long I was looking at prison. It was a long time. I went to there. My parents forked out all their money to try to help out. And before I know it, I was standing before the judge, and Judge Adi sends me to serve 13 years in prison and I have 17 years of probation. It was a 30 year sentence split. The first prison I was sent to it was called Jackson. I don't know how many of you know about the prison system or not, but Jackson, for the guys, it's the first prison any guy ever goes to once they get sentenced. For the girls, there's three major prisons. There's one prison they get sent to. It's kind of the same process. There's no way I could stand up here and tell you what prison was like. I can't go through every day and tell you what that culture is truly like. It's a different world, but I'll share this brief moment with you. When I left out of the county jail, we left out. We were all handcuffed and shackled, leg irons around our ankles, and we had belly chains around our waist. We took off on this bus. We pulled up to Jackson. To me, that's an enormous prison. Whether you know this or not, it's a maximum security prison. It's where they house all the death row inmates in Georgia. It's also a diagnostic center, which means every person goes through there first. They find out and evaluate you, like if your mental health, physical problems, whatever it is, so they know what prison to determine you go to. So as soon as we pull up to this prison, it's enormous. There's all this razor wire on the fence. You can barely see through it. Guard towers all the way around it. The gates open up. Our bus pulls through. The correctional officers come outside. They start screaming and shouting at us. There's about 50 of us. They push us into this room. It's called the intake room. Every jail and every prison has an intake room. They're all set up a little bit different, though. So as soon as I walk in here, there's these four big yellow lines on the, on the ground. We were instructed to stay on the yellow lines. We stripped by naked. We went into the shower. They sprayed us with this stuff that de us because of the nasty lice you can pick up from other people you're locked up with. After that, you get back on the yellow lines, you get dressed in a white jumpsuit, a pair of boots, and they send you out for some more testing. And finally, at the end of the day, you're sent to a cell block. Because of my charges and because of the amount of time I had and because I was drinking, I was considered a violent offender. I was a level five. So I was sent to F house, which meant I had to be locked down in this two-man cell for about 23 hours a day. This is one of the pictures from, from Jackson. So I know that I was sent to cell 225. It was all the way up in the top range. So I walk up there and I stand there in front of the cell. I was told to go to 225, an officer down below. It's all electronic when they open the doors. They have to shut it manually. They hit a button. 
The door came open. I stepped inside. He started screaming and shouting at me to shut the door, so of course I shut the door. But at that moment, I felt like that place was so loud I could barely think. It wasn't like in some movie. There wasn't anybody yelling at me or screaming at me or saying anything. It was just it's all concrete and steel. This particular prison's old. They have bars everywhere. So the only way you can ever get anything from one cell to the next all the way down is you have to yell at the person next door. They're the ones that have to pass stuff for you. So if somebody all the way down there wanted some type of item or wanted something from, from the cell next to me at 224 and they needed to get all the way down to 270, whatever, you have to yell at each person, get each person out of their bed so they can pass everything down the right way. So people are yelling constantly all day long because you're locked down 23 hours a day. You have one hour that you ever get out. So that right there, I guess, is what caused the loud, where I could barely think. But I knew I had to pull it together. I had to adjust to all this because, of course, in this small cell, you have to share it with someone else. The way it worked over here is the older guys only got the bottom bunk. The younger guys got the top. I was 23 at the time. So I talked to my cellmate a little bit. He was on the bottom. I jump up on the top bunk and I lie down. You know what? Shortly after that, as they did every single night I was in prison, they hit the lights. It just means they dim them. When they dimmed the lights, that cell block to me, it finally fell dead silent. And I could think again. It's like the whole time I laid up there that night, all I could think about was what I did and about how much time I had to serve and about how messed up life was. And to be honest, I just wanted it to be over. I wanted it all to stop. I wanted it to be done. I don't know how any of you would feel in this situation, but it's a real messed up situation to be in. And I'm going to tell you, I did think about committing suicide when I was in there at the beginning because I didn't know how to handle all this. A lot of people do it when they're in prison. It's messed up. But I knew if I did something else dumb in my life, all I was going to do was hurt everyone else around me. An example is like, I'm not ashamed to tell everyone how I feel about my family. Like, I love my family. We believe in family very much so, very close. My mom and dad, they were married for 30 years. To me, I thought that was a big deal. But after I made this decision in my life, after I made this choice, I'm here to tell you that my parents felt like they failed as parents. They fell completely apart. They divorced. My dad moved to Tampa, Florida. My mom stayed up here near me, but they felt like they failed. And my parents didn't do anything wrong. My parents always told me not to drink and drive. They told me not to get myself in a bad situation. They told me what would happen. But I didn't take anything serious. Then I have a younger sister. Her name is Angela. She's five years younger than me. My sister used to idolize me. I have no idea if any of you have any brothers or sisters, but my sister, she looked up to me. I remember like in high school, I played sports. I loved football, I loved all sports. My sister would come to every one of my games. She idolized me. She thought I was the coolest brother to ever have. In prison for eight and a half years, my sister came and saw me five times. It's not even once a year. She hated going to the prison. She hated what happened. She hated everything that was around this situation. She was a senior in high school when I went to prison. It messed everything up for her for her senior year. Just to give you a little bit of idea, my sister, I think, personally tried to get some attention before her senior year was done. She didn't even have a chance to graduate that year. She got pregnant. And I'm telling you, life changed. I'm sure she was tired of everybody worried about me going to prison. I get it. All I'm trying to share with each one of you is let you have an idea that when you make choices in your life, that does matter. It impacts people around you. Whether you want to take it serious or not, man, why not do something positive in your life? Not have something negative like this happen. It's like every day I think about this, this is like, this is my life right here. Non-stop. It doesn't go away. How can it? After eight and a half years of being in prison, eventually I was released. You know, inside prison, it wasn't like they were all bad people, man. There's people in there no different than any person in here. It just separates you with one choice. A lot of people between 18 and 24, something like that. I mean, there was a lot of people. Over here, the judge said that as long as I'm out of prison, while I'm on either probation or parole, I have to go back to the crash site on April 11th of every year. If I do not go back to the crash site and place this flower memorial, then the judge is going to send me straight back to prison. He'll violate me immediately. I get it. I go here every year and I take a picture so that I can prove it. I don't want it to ever be put in question. So I go every single year. Sometimes I have to go early. Sometimes I go late. It just depends what time of day it is. A lot of times I'm out speaking. Here, 
I remember some student at another school several years ago had uh, raised their hand up to ask me a question. And um, when they raised their hand up to ask this question, some people thought it was disrespectful or thought, man, you know, or some people even laughed or whatever. And I remember the student asking it to me. I don't care what people ask. It's like, it's the only way you ever find out anything in life if you ask questions. So this person raised his hand up and I called out on him and he said, hey man, what was your worst experience in prison? Like, really? And so, you know, I guess if I was sitting there, I'd wonder some of the same things too. I'd wonder, is prison as bad as what people say it is? Or is it not that bad? Or what's the situation about that? Here's the thing. If you hear of people that go back to prison, and you think it's not that bad, and think it must not be that bad, because people keep on going back once they get out, that's not the way it is. I know this now, because once you're out of prison, you're a convicted felon. You have a hard life in front of you. It's hard to get accepted back into society. It's not easy. I can promise you this. It's very hard to stay out of prison once you get out, because you've made life challenging. I get it. Man, some people can't go back. They can't, they can't function outside of prison anymore. They have to go back in. That's the only way they know how to survive. So for me, my worst experience in prison, you know, I used to think it was going to be what could happen to me in prison. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you I was never in any fights. That's a culture of being in there. That happens. You know, you're either going to make it or you're not. All right. All I'm thankful for is that nothing ever escalated much worse after fights inside prison because it's a messed up place. All kinds of stuff happens. It was much worse than I thought, so I'm very glad that nothing else worse like that happened. But I'm going to tell you this. Honestly, my worst experience had nothing to do with any of that stuff. It was like on November 22nd, 2007. It was on Thanksgiving. My whole family visited me in prison. Even Eric, right over here, he came and visited me. I did not know Eric before any of this. I met Eric while I was in prison. It's a whole different story, but I didn't know Eric before any of this. But Eric used to come visit me in prison. He was there on this day, weren't you? So you know what it was like coming to see me. I mean, even Eric being in his wheelchair, when he went in, the correctional officers made sure that he didn't have anything on him. He had to be wanted. He had to be patted down. He had to go through the metal detectors. He has to go down to a little pat search. And then for my family to go in, they went through the same thing. They had to make sure they were wearing certain clothes. They couldn't wear certain things. If they did, they weren't allowed to come in and visit. It was a long process, but my family, they did it for me. So, you know, once I got into visitation, I'd be strip search going in, strip search coming out. I was allowed to hug everyone one time at the beginning and one time at the end. So, at the end, as soon as I walk in here and I hug everyone, I sat down. And uh, I'm real thankful. It's Thanksgiving. I'm glad that I'm here with my family. I hate that they had to come into prison to visit me, but I was glad they were there. And my dad that day, he sat right across from me. And I don't know how to explain this to anybody, but when I was inside prison, I never got closer to my dad in my whole life. I guess it was because he lived all the way in Tampa. I knew I messed his life up. I know that they lost all their savings because of me. And I, I know that he had every reason not to come visit me. But my dad would drive about eight hours all the way up to visit me for three or four hours, turn around, get back in his car, and drive another eight hours to go home. So I guess at that moment, I had never been closer because I never respected my dad more. Here's the thing, though. We had two things that were in common. We both loved football and we both loved fishing. So I guess I thought maybe when I got out of prison, I was, had this fantasy of going to be able to take my dad out to some football games, and we were going to enjoy time, and we are going to make up for all this time that I was inside prison. And that's a lie. You can't make up for anything once you go away like that. I remember that day I shook my dad's hand and gave him a hug. My mom, she's awesome too. She came every weekend for me while I was in prison. I hugged her. She walked out. And I remember two hours later, I felt so good leading up to this point. Two hours later, these officers came and yanked me out of my cell and escorted me up to the front of visitation. Everybody was gone. I don't know if anyone's ever gone to visit anyone in prison, but once you're out, you're out. Like, they don't let visitors come back in. For some reason, they let my mom back in. I remember when the gate opened up and these officers were standing around me and they wouldn't tell me what happened. And as soon as my mom walked in that door, she told me, and when they got outside, my mom and dad were still good friends. They were married for 30 years. They rode to the prison together. They would ride into Atlanta, and then my dad would drive back. So as soon as my mom walked in, she told me that uh, they were pulling away from the prison. And my dad was in the passenger seat, and he had a massive heart attack, and he died just outside. And she said they did everything they could do. And I'm going to tell you, that to me was my worst experience in prison. I absolutely do miss my dad. Say whatever you want to say. I regret everything about this because I know how much I failed in life. 
I wake up every day knowing how much I messed up. It doesn't go away. All I want out of each one of you is just to think more about your life. Think about the things that you could maybe do different. Instead of always trying to get caught up in what everyone's doing, think about your life. Right over here, Eric, Eric Krug has been like the biggest inspiration of my life. I'm so glad I had a chance to meet Eric. I don't know what life would be like if I hadn't. He helps me get through life. It's not easy, but uh, he helps me out a lot because sometimes I think it's so bad. Sometimes I, I just don't like going forward. I, I have a hard time. And then he picks me up and he helps me. I'm going to share this picture with you so you have a little bit of an idea of Eric's past. This is Eric in high school. He uh, played baseball and football. He was a good athlete. He played over at Brookwood in Gwinnett County. And, uh, you know, life has changed for him a lot. It's not the same as it used to be. But somehow he finds the will to go forward every day. And I guess he inspires me in a lot of different ways. Eric's my best friend. Give you a little bit of an idea. Eric had a dream of going to play college baseball. He didn't care what school it was at, he just wanted to play ball. That was it. So eventually, he went to college, and uh, by his junior year of college, he was voted the most valuable defensive player of the year. He played second base. He made all conference, he was setting all kinds of records for himself. He was living his dream. And then something happened. The reason I met Eric is because they did a documentary of my life when I was in prison. They came in and they did this TV thing and they followed what I was doing inside prison. And they did it so that they could share with other people. Eric and his mom wanted to know why they did that for me. Like, why did they come in and pick me? Because, you see, Eric is in the condition he is because he's a victim of a DUI crash. So his mom wanted an opportunity to meet me in prison. She set it all up. They came to prison, both Eric and his mom. And I was scared that when I met them, all they were going to do was yell at me. They had all these officers around me. They didn't know what to, no one knew what to expect. But that day, Eric and his mom just listened to me talk. They became friends with me. They asked to come back. They came back every weekend until I got out of prison. That was almost four years. Every weekend he was there for me. I know his story really well now. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of ways he can communicate, right? I know if Eric could, he would love to talk in his microphone and tell you his story. But he can't do it. Because of his injuries, he's limited the way he communicates. This is one of the ways, though. This is how I got to know him when I was inside prison. He pointed to these letters and these words in this box here. This is how he would do it. It's not really easy to follow, though. Eric still has a great vocabulary. He's able to spell very well. But sometimes it's hard. All the words run together, so you have to be really patient. At least he does. And he was patient with me every second of the, the, the day. Every time we, we talked, I mean, visit for hours. And I know that for something like this, right, Eric, it doesn't work. That board right there doesn't work for him to share with you. After he'd been in prison for, you know, and, and, and gone to visit me for so long, when I got out of prison, I did want to help in any way I could. It was like the iPad came out shortly after that. And the iPad has definitely changed his life. It's helped him out a ton. It gives him a voice, right? I know it's not the voice that you necessarily want, right? It's not like what you dreamed of, but it helps, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean... Not being able to communicate is hard. I mean, for instance, like Eric does know sign language, don't you? But, but you made it up, so no one else really gets it unless we have been together. Like, we hang out all the time. I've known you now for nine years, so I get it. I mean, everyone else wouldn't understand it. The only time they would get it is, like, if I get on your nerves, like, all the time, right? I know, and you give me that sign language, that one that really gets my attention. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Like, that works, okay? But other than that, I mean... Not having the ability to communicate, it's hard. So this iPad has just helped out tremendously. And um, it helps him express himself. I mean, here's a huge example. Eric and I were traveling last week, and um, he wanted to go out to eat. So we picked this Applebee's, and we went over to this Applebee's, and they sat us kind of up towards the front. Eric sometimes uses a walker. He'd prefer to use that than his wheelchair. So they sat us up front. And I remember we walked in, we sat down, and as soon as we sat down, man, Eric gets my attention. And he starts pointing over at this waitress. He thinks this waitress is real cute. So he wants me to call her over. 
So I was like, okay, man, I'll call her over. And, and this is like how Eric goes out when he's dressed up. Like this is like his presentation uniform, if we can say. You know, he has this bright fluorescent hat. He matches with the shirt, underneath shirt. His sunglasses, they match. His shoes, his socks. His watch is fluorescent. And then I ain't gonna tell you about his boxers. It's the same thing, man. So it's crazy. <laughs> But, I know, I'm sorry, man, I shouldn't call that. Listen, so all I'm trying to say is when he went out, he likes to have those vibrant colors because it's his personality. And this girl, this cute waitress, she did want to come over and talk to Eric, and Eric had already been typing out everything. And so, when he typed out, this is kind of like his big line. If he sees a cute girl, and he, he first thing he looks at is her, is her nails, because that's like his, that's his go-to line. So he told her, you know, how cute her nails were. Now, it's, when he really wants to pick up his game, this is the, one of the cool things about having the iPad and the applications that go with it is, is that he can change his accents. So I remember that night he went British on us. And she went British. <laughs> but I kind of wanted you to have a little bit of an idea of how, how this has helped out Eric because, you know, it's going to be real hard for him or for me to... To really get his personality out, to get you to know him the way I do. Eric, it's hard to type, in, isn't it? I mean, he has to take his time typing, so for him to engage in conversations with you back and forth, it takes a lot of time. Um, he can get everything out, he can form out all of his sentences, he has a great vocabulary, and he has an awesome personality, but it does take a second. So like for something like here, he's worked real hard by typing a whole speech out, so you don't have to wait for him to talk. He just wants to share things, and then it gives him his, his time when he types it like this to get his story out the way he wants to. So you'll see his personality when he shares this with you, and, and just listen to what he has to say because um, I know that everything he does is important, and all he cares is about each one of you. So please, uh, go ahead, Eric, if you want to, if you want to start out. I wish I could talk without this like that, but I cannot. I also need help from my friends and family to communicate some of my thoughts. Simple things like talking and walking are a struggle every day of my life. I had lifelong injuries because I got in a car with a drunk driver. She was my roommate's girlfriend. Now, my roommate is dead and my life is messed up. Suffering from a traumatic brain injury has ruined all of my dreams, like playing professional baseball or completing my college degree. Now, this is my never-ending nightmare which began on my 21st birthday. I wish life was different, but it is not. Heck, can you believe it? I have not gone on a real date in 18 years. I know I am not, not. Seriously, though, if you can hook me up with a girl my age, please holler at me after the presentation. Thank you. You want to make sure you put some important stuff in there at the end, didn't you? I got you. That is important. Um, you know, I'm always amazed at his, his sense of humor, I guess, right, Eric? Like, humor, like, he loves going to see comedy stuff. He's just all about laughing. I guess it does make things a lot better for, for him and for anyone else who goes through stuff. And, you know, I know that he can make something that seems like it's funny, but it really isn't. Like that example of, like, his dating life, like, I don't know how hard you could imagine this being, but the last time that Eric was on a real date, right, Eric? It was on his 21st birthday. It was on April 11th of 97. Eric and I, uh, we share the same date. My crash happened on April 11th of 2000. His happened on April 11th of 97. We both met each other in April of 2006. I can't explain all those things. All I can do is share it with you. But I want you to know that we do have some things that link our story together. Now, Eric's girlfriend, she was from New Jersey, right? Her name was Marie. They've been together for eight months. She was there the night of this crash. But Eric really, truly has not been on a date since then. So I just want you to think for just a moment of what life might be like if you lose that social aspect, if you lose that part. Because it would be really hard, I would imagine. I was in prison for eight and a half years. I can't even imagine 18 plus years. But he still keeps he still keeps hope up. He doesn't give up. It's like just because he hasn't been on a date for 18 and a half years or 18 years doesn't mean he just quits. He continues to always compliment girls. He always asks for people if they want to go on dates. He's never giving up, no matter how frustrating it gets. 
And then, like, could you imagine what life would be like losing a lot of your friends? I mean, here Eric was an awesome athlete in, 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 in high school and college. He had great friends. He has awesome teammates. I remember uh, last year I went out with all these old former teammates from the year uh, in college when the crash happened. Man, they were awesome guys. There were all a lot of coaches around here throughout the state uh, on a lot, and a lot of different high schools. Ones you would probably know, there were a lot of his friends. So, you know what? They're great people. It's not that. But I want, I want Eric to share this part with you. I mean, Eric, I know, like, I like hanging out with friends. And you like hanging out with friends. I know we already hang out too much, but we and you don't count, okay? I want you to tell them how often you get to hang out with all of your friends that you grew up with. Like, everybody that you know so well. How, how, how many times a year? Twice a year you get to hang out with everyone? They'll take you to a Braves game, won't they? Might take you out to eat? But like twice a year. What do you think he does the rest of the time? I know he hangs out with me. I take him to move and go out to eat. It's not the same though. I know it's not. But you know what? Eric, are you mad at anybody? He's not mad at anyone. He just moves on forward in life. All he cares about is being here in front of people like you. This is what his life is about. He believes he lived through this so he could be here in front of students just like you. The night that this crash happened was on April 10th is when it first started out. Eric uh, had a huge baseball game it was against a rival college. Eric played second base. His best friend Tim played third base. That night, Eric and Tim made a double play. They had won the game. They had like one of the best nights ever. So when the buses and everyone took off to come back to the dorms, it was right here in Atlanta, and when they got back to the dorms, um, Eric and all his teammates knew that on, at midnight would be April 11th, Mark Eric's 21st birthday, so they all, the whole team wanted to take him out. They were all still tired from the game, and they were also pumped up from the win, but they just knew at midnight they could get Eric out there, celebrate his 21st birthday, and have a good time. So they all promised each other that if someone was riding in a car and the person was drinking, that they promised to take a cab back, right? That was the deal. So they all go out. At midnight, they start drinking. Then finally, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're all done. And they're tired from the night, and they're, you know, they've been celebrating his birthday pretty hard. And so they, Eric's sister was with Eric. Eric's sister grabbed Eric and his girlfriend and stuck them in a taxi that night to go home, to go back to campus down the road. So as soon as she puts them in the taxi, she said she reached in, she gave him a hug, and she said, I love you, brother. I'll meet you back in the dorms. And when she walked away, that's when Eric's friends had been standing all around this taxi, and they're all cutting up and laughing, and it's loud, and she walks away. This is like one of the things I was telling you about, how it's easily to be influenced when you're having fun. Eric's best friend, Tim, he was the team captain. Um, he was a senior in college, and uh, several of the other friends of Eric's friends were standing there, and they just thought it was dumb. They were like, man, why are you going to jump in this taxi and go back? Like, right back with us. Because you didn't have that far to go, did you? How far did you guys really have to go? 3.5 miles, 3.5 miles. So at the time, you even thought it was dumb too, didn't you? So Eric and his girlfriend easily got out of the car, out of that taxi, jumped in the car with their friends. Tim, it was his girlfriend that was going to drive that night. Her name was Missy. She was athlete of the year. She played soccer. She was 19. She had a fake ID, so down here she was still drinking with everybody else, but she said she was fine. They all got in the car with her. She drove back to campus. Right when she pulled on the campus, she made a right-hand turn. And as she was going around this turn, the speed limit was between like 25 and 35. She was going about 40, not real fast. But as soon as she got next to the dorm, she passed out. And she swerved the car right into some trees across from where they were going to park. And when she hit those trees, it was with enough force that Eric's best friend, Tim, he was from New York, he was sitting from the back seat. When they hit, his head went straight forward into the dashboard and slid his head open on the radio. Tim, he died like 10 hours later. They retired his jersey, number 17. Eric, he was in the passenger seat. He had his right arm hanging out the window. So it said that uh, when they hit the trees, initially his arm got pinned between and smashed between the trees and the car door. And it broke all of his bones up his arm and then it severed it at the elbow. Now, when they had to reconstruct it, reattach it, his hand didn't heal right, and his arm doesn't have any motion left. So, like, I'm pulling back on it as hard as I can. That's how far he can reach. But other than that, it's down here. His fingers won't come open. He can't grab a baseball anymore. He can't grab a football. All that stuff, it's over for him. No matter how much he tries, it just won't open. 
then that's a small part of his injury, right? Like that's the deal. He had a seatbelt on, there was a small Jetta, but even though he still was strapped in, it was still such a force when they hit the trees, his head went up and caught and went through the front window, then it pulled back out, and then it hit against the trees on the side, so it fractured his skull in two spots and it broke his neck. Then his brain swelled, and they said it swelled so bad that there was nothing else they could do, he just fell into a coma, and they fell into a coma for a long time, for over a year. He was in three different hospitals. He started at a DeKalb Medical Center, then he was transferred to the Shepherd Center, then he went to a nursing home, and then he went to Scottish Rite. So here he is, uh, over here, this is a picture of him. He played at Oglethorpe University, so this is him right here. Then over here next to him is uh, right after the crash when he's in ICU. And if you wonder why his friends have a hard time seeing him, because they would go to the hospital and they saw how changed life was. And I guess they all have a hard time accepting it, even 18 years later. It's a hard thing, isn't it, Eric? It's a hard thing for everyone. Here Eric is at uh, the Shepherd Center. They had moved him over here, and um, they had felt like you know they were going to be able to help him some. But his eyes were open in here, but even though they were open, he still um, was in a coma. It's not like he was conscious. If he sat up... His eyes would close. He wasn't responding to anything. He's breathing very hard. And they weren't sure what to expect, whether he was going to live or if he was going to die. He had a trait. They would move him from a hospital bed. His mom told me they'd move him and set him in a chair because he had bed sores and staph infection, pneumonia. So he'd move his body around a lot to try to get response. But here he ran about 104 temperature. That was at the beginning stages because he was fighting off infections. You too. And then, of course, when you're immediately in the hospital and you're suffering these injuries, you know, they do physical therapy. Even though you can't respond, they still move your body around because they want to stimulate your brain to do something. But if you are not able to move or respond, eventually your insurance, or the, is, they're not going to pay for it anymore. No one's going to pay for it because they don't believe you're going to go any further. So, unfortunately, he hit a wall. And they eventually said there was nothing else they could do, so they put him in the nursing home. Eric's mom... She's awesome. Her and her whole family went over to Children's Health Care, who were Scottish Rite, and asked them to please take Eric in. They knew he was 21, he was still at the cutoff, but they just wanted him to try anything else, so they did. And that hospital worked with Eric very hard, his whole family. Eventually he got to go home. He went back to Snellville, Georgia. Everybody there was pulling for him and supporting him and trying to help him. But his mom and dad told me that uh, when he came into the house, they had to get a hospital bed put in the dining room. They put Eric in there. Eric was in adult diapers. He couldn't control himself. He wasn't responding. He was still in a coma state. Um, his mom, his dad, his brother, and his sister would take turns daily. They would take turns changing him. Then they would drag him upstairs to give him a bath. They didn't have a handicapped accessible home. You know what? I know that no one in their family ever gave up, including Eric, right? About three years later, Eric learned how to walk with a walker. They didn't think it would ever be possible. Then he was able to communicate a whole lot with his board. He started finding other ways to communicate. He started making people laugh. He started grabbing his vocabulary. Everything started coming back. It was coming back slow, though. Then here he is 18 years later. Even though you see something that looks so hard for him to get up and walk over here, honestly, he doesn't need my help. I grab him because I know he feels more support. Because of his brain injury, he feels like he's always fallen over. He's fallen over a bunch of times, but I know that he can walk. I've seen him walk from this across this whole stage before without anyone helping him. It's just scary, isn't it? It's not like he can't do it. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, those are his days. He goes to the gym and he works out. <laughs> it's not like he ever gives up. Just because he can't get on the bench and hit heavy weight anymore doesn't mean he stops. Man, he's relentless. I guess that's another thing that always encourages me because a lot of times I want to give up. I don't want to do anything. I want to sit there. And I know Eric has every right to have a card in his back pocket that says, leave me alone. I'm not doing anything anymore. I'm staying inside. I don't want to see anybody. But he never pulls out that imaginary card. Eric is always about doing something good for people. He's always about trying to make people laugh. He's always about trying to get better. So I guess in moments in your life when maybe you think it's so bad, Think about it more. Someone always has it worse. 
Eric wanted me to show this video to you. It's um, the video is called it's Still My Life. We just appreciate it if you took a glance at it and thought about it. It's a collection of pictures of him growing up and, uh, you know, life after the crash. Looking back on the memory of the dance we shared beneath the stars above for a moment all the world was right how could I have known that you'd ever say goodbye see it from a different point of view so that they think about the good things that they can do with themselves and see how much bad can happen by not thinking through your choices. Eric helped me about a year ago to um, to write a book and uh, it's not like we're some great authors or anything like that but it has been one way that we've communicated our message to a lot of people. And uh, we brought a few of the books here. If any of you at the end of the presentation want one, we'll just give them to you. If not, you can go to the website and ask for them. We'll spam them to you for free. You don't have to buy them or anything like that. But we just want to share it so we have another way to get our message out. And it's something we strive to do. Eric doesn't like ending um, our presentations like with a bunch of bad stuff. He wants to always share some personal stuff 
stuff that uh, means a lot to both he and I. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, this is another part of my inspiration in life. This is kind of what keeps me going. I've been out for six years. I've been trying to rebuild my life. It's not really easy. Um, it's very hard, but I'm so thankful to have an opportunity to have a great family. Right here is my daughter, Madison Ray. Here's Zachary Daniel, one with the big head. It's still that way. Um, we still try to have fun. We go, you know, we do have fun. We still, you know, we're people. All right, so like we went to Myrtle Beach, right, Eric? And um, that's what we did this summer. And of course, well, all of our families went. And so both my kids, they, they always look at Eric and they, they call him Unky the Monkey. That's his nickname. Um, he loves it, whatever. But it's always funny because like, they don't understand him. You know, use an iPad, they still don't get it. But the way they communicate with them is like through like eyes. Like they still talk to him all the time and then you know they'll steal his walker from him and laugh and they'll take his iPad and play games, but they have a great unique bond. Um, he's actually Uncle Eric. And the reason he's Uncle Eric is Eric's such an awesome friend and he's been so good to me. He introduced me to his sister. His sister and I uh, got married on October 25th, 2009. And uh, so now Eric's not just my best friend, he's also my brother-in-law. And we do this as a family. It means a lot to both of us. We try to have as much fun as we can. Just an example, here at Myrtle Beach, after we did our funny pose, our job was to uh, go back up to the room and get dressed and go out to the ocean. We're going to get Eric out there. It's not easy. It's not like it's, uh, it's, not like it's always a lot of fun. It can be challenging, can it, Eric? You know, there's a lot of things that come with this. But as a family, we're all there. We do this together. And so I remember we got the Myrtle, Myrtle Beach Police Department's the one who actually helped us out. They brought us a chair over free of charge. They helped us get Eric in it. We pushed Eric all the way out into the ocean. We lifted him out of the chair. We set him down in the ocean and let him enjoy it. It was the first time in a long time. And even though it was complicated, man, we still had fun. That's us. It's our, we're here together as a family. I just want you to think about what you can do as a person to make life better for everyone around you. Because when you start doing good, good things are going to happen. You can avoid all this nonsense and this regret. Live your life the way you're supposed to. Eric has had the opportunity to, to do a lot of different presentations with people. Shaquille O'Neal came out and he did about five presentations with Eric. They traveled around about five different schools in the cab. And uh, you know he's a pretty cool guy. He's been helpful, but Eric has uh, inspired a lot of people. It doesn't have to be some celebrity or some famous athlete or something like that. Eric's been with a lot of people. He just wants to inspire people like you and what you do in your life. So with that being said, if you have an opportunity, you can check us out over on the website at Enduring Regret or go to, we're always going to post stuff on Twitter or Facebook. We would appreciate anything you could ever give us back for feedback. And, once again, if you want one of the books or something before you leave out of here, just come and visit us afterwards. We thank you all for being respectful and for listening to our stories. Eric's going to end it with this last thing as we bring it to a close. So, I am still working hard every day at the things most people take for granted. I struggle trying to speak. I couldn't walk without my walker. And I am still working for my first date in 18 years. I know it's sad and I need to pick up my game. But, no matter what, I am still thankful to be alive and to have this opportunity to speak to you. I hope each of you will be encouraged to make good choices and be influenced to inspire the people around you. I wish all of you the best. Here is my attempt at closing this speech. Even though he struggles with it, doesn't mean he quits. Please. Thank you all. Please take care. God bless.